Just went solo camping recently, and my close-ish neighbors who were RV camping were the absolute worst. They were drunk off their asses day or night, which is fine, but that meant they were extremely loud while thinking no one could hear them. Multiple things were said about me and their other neighbors, including her black tent, means she's a part of BLM. I think she's a Ann Mutt. I'm biracial. Women like her are going to be the end of us. She's obviously doing drugs. She's obviously a lesbian then, a bunch of xenophobic shit about the other campers. Half the time they sat there literally just watching me set up, process wood, etc. These dudes then proceeded to drive their truck by my campsite a few times and once actually came to a full stop and just sat there staring. One of the couples that were part of their camp also got into a bad fight during the day. I have camped a good amount in my life, and they topped the worst people I've been next to. It was honestly bizarre. I ended up staying for two days, because I was watching for eagles, but the trip was definitely a bummer. Outside of them, most neighbors and trips have been wonderful. Finally, a chance for me to tell my story. About ten years ago, my family and I were up in the White Mountains of Arizona to cut down our Christmas tree. My dad was driving our truck with my grandfather in the front seat and my mom and sister in the back seat. I was in the bed of the truck along with our family's German short-haired pointer. We were driving along a forest road and all of a sudden my dog starts barking and growling. So I look to see what it is, thinking it is maybe a bear or mountain lion. What I saw was a tall, dark figure walking parallel to the road, just about 60 to 70 yards away. I yelled at my dad to stop the truck. When I told him I think I see Bigfoot, he just laughed and continued to drive. When I looked back to get another look at it, the figure had changed directions and was walking away from the road. The last thing I saw was the thing's head disappearing down a hill. To this day, I still do not have an explanation for what I saw. And every time the situation comes up, my dad always makes me tell everyone my story just so he could laugh. Myself, along with four other guys, decided to park on Anthony Road and walk out to the middle of a field to have some beer. We lived in a small town with not much to do. Keep in mind, however, that we hadn't yet started drinking, and even if we had, I don't think it would have caused a group hallucination. The reason we had guns was due to an incident prior to this, where my female cousin and her friends, who were all about five years younger than us, came back to my aunt's house one night very scared. They said that they were driving down Anthony Red when a guy was lying in the middle of the road. They had to stop the car since it's a narrow road, so they couldn't turn around. They put the car in reverse to back up, and just then, the guy in the road jumped up and started chasing the car. People came out of the cornfields trying to open the car doors and stop the car. They took off in drive, came back to the house, and told us what happened. Hence the presence of guns the night of our encounter. The night we had our encounter was very bright. There was a full moon or near full, shining down on some pretty thick fog that was about chin high, so visibility was quite high. We drove up and down the road once, just to make sure no cops were parked anywhere, and then we spotted the field we wanted to go into. It was really cool looking, with the fog lying heavy on the ground and the moon bouncing off of it, giving a really cool glow effect. We parked two cars and began to venture into the field at the area where tractors would enter. We walked about 20 or 30 yards in and stopped to listen for cars and to make sure no one else was around. One of us noticed something large and dark along the wood line to our right, about 150 yards out into the field. We all stopped talking and watched it for a few minutes, trying to determine what it was, a tree stump, large rock, bush, etc., after a few minutes, we decided it was just a big bush and stopped paying attention to it, walking further into the field. After going into the field a little more, 
one of us noticed the object wasn't there where we had seen it before. We began to scan the area to see where it went, and then we noticed something running from right to left across the field in front of us. It looked to be about three feet above the fog line, if not four feet. That would make it bigger than any dog. The way it ran reminded me of a cheetah or greyhound dog reaching out with long forelimbs to grab the ground and then hurling its hind haunches under itself to spring forward again. Its silhouette looked like a wild boar or hyena with the stereotypical large hump on its upper back. It ran really, really fast to the center of the field and then turned directly towards us. I've never seen anything able to change direction as fast as this thing did, especially considering how fast it was traveling. At first, we thought it had stopped running, but then after a second, we were able to tell it was now coming straight at us. We were all asking and commenting with each other, trying to reason what it was, dog, cougar, bear, etc. As it continued its charge, we raised our guns at it. I had a shotgun, and two of the other guys had pistols. When we raised our guns, it began to zigzag. I remember thinking that it knew what guns were. I remember seeing, or one of us said, that thing knows we are pointing guns at it. I think that's when we got creeped out enough to run for the cars. My buddy, the Facebook guy, said he didn't shoot because he couldn't identify the target. I personally, and I'm not ashamed to say, think it's because we all got scared, realizing it wasn't any known animal. It was moving so fast that I thought if I missed, or if my first shot didn't stop it, I wouldn't get a second shot. Shotguns are only effective within certain distances, and I didn't want it getting too close to me. As we were running away, my friend at the time fell into a groundhog hole, so I had to run back and help him up so we could get to the cars. Given how fast it was running, I don't think it was really trying to catch us, or it would have, when we got to the cars and took off, I recall looking out the side window, and this thing was chasing the cars. Once we got over the little bridge on Anthony onto Manning Road, we were able to get up more speed. I don't think it ever came out of the field or across the bridge, though. It was as if it just wanted to chase us off. It never stood up on two legs, and I didn't notice any eye shine. I think it may have been too far away when it started its charge to see the eyes. I can tell you that it was bigger than any dog and much, much faster. It was able to zigzag really fast, like a rabbit. It was very jerky in its side, the side movement, almost twitchy, I'd say. I got the feeling that it was so quick and agile that I might not be able to get a bead on it to get good hits on it with a shotgun. When we were pulling away in the car is probably when I got the best look at it. It had odd body mechanics as it ran. It reminded me of a cheetah, and I could tell the forelimbs were longer than the hind limbs. I couldn't see a tail or the shape of the ears, however. Relevant background info. I've always loved to dance. When I was nine, we moved into a bungalow. My new bedroom had a big, wide window that took up roughly half of the wall, and for some reason I didn't have any curtains. But weird in hindsight, but it suited me just fine because at night this window would serve as the perfect mirror for me to watch myself dance, and I would just pretend I was in my own studio. The window faced into the backyard, which was loosely fenced, shitty old fence that provided little privacy, but single mom who worked a lot and barely getting by as it is a replacing fence not major priority one summer i had just got back from visiting family in europe i was 12 my mom and brother had also been on the trip but had returned home about a month earlier i go in my room and notice that my mom has hung curtains it struck me as odd even then because my mom was not the type to spontaneously do nice things for me, but I just assumed she had missed me and wanted to make my room cozier for when I got back something. I forgot about it until about a week later when I bring up the curtains. Before my mom can say anything, my younger brother goes, You haven't told her. Told me what? Well, apparently, while I was away, my mom and brother were just hanging out in the living room, 
which is beside the front door. One night, when suddenly my dog started barking like there was someone at the door. It was past midnight, so my mom was understandably freaked out, especially being there alone with a ten-year-old. Anyway, there is no knock at the door, but my dog is still losing it, so they turn out the lights to try and see if there's something outside. They see two people walking around the front yard with flashlights, turning the corner into the backyard. So my mom opens the door just wide enough to let the dog out to investigate. Someone starts yelling to get the damn dog under control, and they realize it's two police officers. My mom gets the dog under control and asks them what's going on. They tell her that they are responding to a call reporting a man seen sitting in a tree on the southwest corner of our backyard, staring into a window. You can probably guess which window. Anyway, I didn't sleep in my room for a month after that and couldn't think about it without feeling on the verge of a panic attack for years. Since then, I am always very, very vocal about people having curtains. You may not suspect it, but you never know who could be watching you from the dark. So because of work, I had to move out to Kern County in Southern California. Aside from hot weather patterns and dryness here and there, it's generally pretty nice. The house I ended up selecting was out in the pines since the housing costs were cheaper up here. However, I would have been better off spending more on something closer to town. I'm convinced that there is something living up here that is somewhat intelligent, about two weeks after moving in, I started having trouble sleeping. I would toss and turn and have horrible nightmares that I would only vaguely remember when I woke up. One night it was particularly bad. I woke up shaking and sweating like a pig, so I decided to wander into the living room and sit up a few minutes. I was still half asleep and a little delirious, but it seemed to me that the room was darker than usual. So I sat down and turned on my TV. About that time, I heard something heavy bolt across my porch, like a man running at full speed. I looked out the window and realized that I could see the moon when before I could not. Whatever it was had been standing there right in front of the window, blocking the moonlight. Over the next few days, things were relatively stable, except for a few oddities. Things would move from where I had placed them, but not drastically. On one occasion, I found the remains of a dead coyote in my yard though I'm not entirely positive that it's related. Overall, I wasn't too worried about whatever was causing this, because obviously it hadn't done anything to hurt me. So why would I have to worry? Except the events that happened last night have spurred me to post this story and seek some possible solution to this little issue. I arrived home late last night after spending time performing maintenance on the company server. When I pulled up into the yard, it was deathly quiet, no crickets or anything. I had this feeling like I was being watched. While I can't explain the exact feeling I had with 100% accuracy, I can say it felt like what you would expect to be facing something that wanted to harm you, like a wild animal or something. The problem was I didn't hear or see anything. It was a real physiological sensation that was not quick to leave. I forced myself to sleep that night, but the dreams came back causing me to toss and turn. There was no way that I was going to walk back into the living room last night, either in the event that whatever it was I saw before is back, watching from outside. I do not look forward to going home tonight. Part 2. I'm writing this update from an internet cafe as I've discovered that I have lost power to my house. It's purely coincidental, of course and in no way linked to my current situation. I called up the power company and was assured that someone would be up to take a look at it in the morning. After leaving work today, I took a short drive through the mountains to steady my nerves. It worked, but only in part. The forested valleys and rivers are beautiful. Even the deserts hold their own. I was starting to feel alive again, but... I couldn't shake the subtle feeling of dread knowing that I would have to spend another night. Well, anyways, I started home and arrived at the two-lane road which ascends into the forested area above where my residence is. 
There are a few sporadic houses on the way up, including my closest neighbor's house, where I happened to notice a police car and ambulance park. The subtle dread and apprehension started to make itself more apparent as I passed by. I arrived home, and the wind had picked up substantially. It was rustling through the trees and leaves, making it difficult to discern any movement from anything non-elemental. I walked up toward my porch and smacked this pine cone, comes flinging into the side of my house. I nearly pass out from the surprise, but then, hey, it's windy. So I walk in, flip my switch, and nothing. No power. Great, I think. There is no way in hell that I'm going to spend the night here without power. I remember reading this article once on the theory of genetic memory and its possible link with phobias. It's the only thing I can think of that would explain the feeling that came next. I heard something moving quickly, something that definitely could not be elemental. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and my body became stiff to the point where it was difficult to raise my arms. I could sense something behind me outside my door and in my yard somewhere. I didn't want to turn around at all. I just wanted to be as far away from that moment as possible. I just stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was most likely only one or two seconds listening. Leaves rustling, twigs and branches blowing against each other. I forced myself to turn around expecting to see some hideous creature standing there smiling at me. It would have been more comforting than just turning around and seeing nothing, which is exactly what I saw. It was like a cruel joke. I made a dash back to my car, jumped in, slammed the door and locked it. Against my better judgment, I decided to drive by my neighbor's house to make sure everything was all right. After having seen the ambulance and police there earlier, at least I would be near other people. My neighbor's wife met me at the door and looked distraught. After some conversation, she explained that she walked into the house and discovered her husband laying on the ground, knocked out. After the paramedics arrived and he came to, he explained what he remembered. He came home and found that the back door of his house was off its hinges, like someone forced their way in with a crowbar or something. After investigating, he walked in and felt this buzzing in his head and wave of nausea. After that, he remembered getting hit in the head with something and then nothing. Of course, considering current events, this unsettled me greatly. So now I find myself sitting in this internet cafe, pondering my next move. I had never heard of Dogman, but I saw one in town run past the floodgates, down by the river on my way to the recently opened park that was closed due to floodwaters. It didn't look like a scary werewolf but more like a weird dog running on three legs. Its tail was curled up. I went on a quest to find out what this was because I have never hallucinated and I knew what I had seen. The ones most people are reporting are not exactly like what I saw. However, had it stopped to look at me, I'm sure I would have found him quite a bit more frightening. Hello? I am hoping you can shed some light on an incident I had a few years ago. I was 25 at the time and was driving to my friend C.W.'s house. It was quiet at 11.30 p.m. as I drove south on an old country road off of Redacted, Highway Near, Reacted, in North Georgia. Very few people pass this way because it leads to nothing but a small group of houses. I turned on the radio, but nothing came on. I figured it was a blown fuse, but then I started to hear weird scratching sounds coming through the speakers. It sounded like a distant voice, but I couldn't understand what it was saying. Suddenly, something flew in front of the car and hit the windshield with enough size and force that it totally mangled the grill and hood. I immediately stopped the car. I heard what sounded like wings flapping on the roof, but then something rolled down the back window onto the trunk then eventually onto the road. I thought I killed whatever it was. A woman in a truck had pulled up from behind and said she saw the thing hit the road. She said that its eyes were glaring bright red. As we looked more closely at this thing, it resembled a man with large bat-like wings. The woman walked back to her truck, pulled a shotgun from the back, and pointed it at this bat-like creature. It was starting to move, and we backed off. 
It slowly stood up on two large raptor, like claws turned and stared directly at us with those terrible bright red eyes. The woman pumped the shotgun. It slowly levitated off the ground with wings spread until it was about ten feet up. Then instantly, it let out a deafening screech as it just disappeared with a loud swoosh. The woman, who I found out later was C.I.D.'s aunt, and I just looked at each other. This thing had the body of a well-built man. It had no feathers but charcoal gray skin like that of a bat with some hair on the shoulders and around the eyes and legs. When it spread its wings, it had a span of 12 feet or more. I estimate it was about 8 feet tall. It had no head, however, just the eyes embedded on the shoulders that had brows. I didn't notice a mouth or nose. There is no way I was going to report this, and Cubby's aunt totally agreed. We both drove off to Cubby's house. I was so shaken up that I stayed the night. The next morning I went outside to inspect the car. There was a huge crack in the windshield, and the grill was mangled beyond repair. The hood also had a deep 25-inch dent. I started to walk back to the house when I noticed something lying in the grass beside the garage. It was C.W.'s golden retriever lying dead from massive lacerations up and down its back. I just knew that thing did it. That was three years ago, and I constantly dream of this creature. I was told by a friend that I had encountered a mothman. It looked more like a Batman, to be honest. I decided to look up a few of the sightings by others and saw your name and blog. Many of the images on Google were very similar to what I saw. I wrote to someone else about a year ago, but they never got back to me. My cousin went on a camping trip with his wife on a rather quiet day for camping. According to my cousin, the ranger informed them that they were the only ones camping at that site for the night. As evening approached, my cousin noticed something across the lake. At first, he thought it might be a bear standing upright, so he grabbed his binoculars. However, it resembled a bear only partially. It was standing on its hind legs. He was certain it wasn't a bear because it had a face resembling that of a 70-year-old man, and its fur was longer than that of a typical bear. He considered the possibility that it could be someone in a suit, but it disappeared swiftly. Whatever it was, it spooked him profoundly, and he wanted to leave the park immediately. His wife, on the other hand, dismissed his concerns as mere imagination and insisted on bringing a shotgun, just in case. That night progressed uneventfully until my cousin was awakened by footsteps. His wife was still asleep, so he didn't want to disturb her. He tried to remain as still and quiet as possible. A figure approached their tent. My cousin positioned himself with his head near the tent's corner. The figure leaned down and gently pressed its hand around the corner of the tent, essentially placing its hands near my cousin's head. He couldn't recall how long this encounter lasted, but eventually the figure departed. My cousin mentioned that it had a peculiar mechanical scent, reminiscent of someone working on a car, although there were no audible signs of a vehicle. The next morning, everything at the campsite remained untouched. There were no issues whatsoever. My cousin didn't find any footprints or evidence suggesting that someone had been there. He later researched the area and discovered that their camping site was supposedly a hot spot for Bigfoot sightings and similar phenomena. He firmly believes that he encountered some form of Sasquatch. I personally have reservations about fully believing his account. I've often thought it might have been someone playing a prank on him. I have several other stories, but I didn't want to make this post overly lengthy or overwhelming. At the time, I lived in northwest Michigan. My hybrid son was taken in mid-April of 2012. They used the word claimed. I carried him for about two months. I knew he was a boy, and I named him Drax, named after Max, his human father, and the draconian reptoids I am involved with. During my pregnancy, my ex was shut down, and I was taken for several hours. When I was coming to, I saw a figure standing at the side of the bed making circles above my stomach. I knew I had just been returned, and I knew they were making one last check on the baby. 
He was brought to me on October 10, 2012, for feeding and bonding. He would leave claw marks on me while feeding. He didn't mean to hurt me. There was absolutely no feeling to the red and infected looking claw marks, and they were basically gone in four hours. There is so much more to this than I could possibly try to write. They have been manipulating my pineal gland. They can use me as a computer loading and downloading information. I feel as if I am ahead of time. I have received many messages from them and continue to. I have many very credible witnesses. They include an attorney, a fireman, or a farmer, and a prison guard. I've been regressed five times, and some are recorded. The psychologist who regressed me would be willing to speak. I need help. I have reached out to many people. The only time I feel okay is when I am sharing what is happening to me. Some of the things that are happening are difficult to share because they make others very uncomfortable. So I'm left holding all this inside. I've been doing illustrations, writing down everything, and keeping track of dates the best I can. This all started in 1960, one when I was 12. It was a sighting daylight with several witnesses, including two police officers. I'm still in contact with the chief of police from back then. Unfortunately, he is 93 and in bad health, along with good and bad memory days. He was at the station and said he fielded calls for over 20 minutes. One of the calls was from a fellow officer at the scene, and another was a city councilwoman. I was discouraged from talking about this in hopes that I would forget. It was the worst thing my parents could have done. I never talked about it for 50 years. It was only when I met a ufologist and college professor on September 1, 2011, that I opened up. I told him of the sighting. That's all I thought it was for 50 years. But I lived with PTSD and panic attacks. I haven't had a pop smear in 20 years and still am unable to watch someone get a shot or IV. He was a smart man and knew there was more to it than that, so he found the regression therapist. At the end of my first regression, I felt myself immobilized and going up into the ship. One of the very first messages they gave me in 2011 was, All memories are packed and taken with us in each new life. When the load becomes too heavy or we no longer have the energy to carry it, we travel as light, knowledge, and energy. This took place in the summer of 2004, around July in the Bristol Bay County. I am a commercial fisherman in Alaska and have been doing so since 1970. I'm an avid outdoorsman hunter and someone who just loves to get out there. Every year after fishing, I try to take a trip upriver with a friend or two to wind down and enjoy ourselves before we go home. This year, while I was on this trip into Alaska's interior, our main mission was to take pictures of bears and the surrounding wildlife to promote a new bear viewing and sports fishing business. While on our five-day trip, we spotted more than 40 bears. I took hundreds of pictures of these bears and their tracks, one of which was so big it put chills up my spine and gave me and my companions a very uneasy sense of insecurity. What set this track apart from the others was its enormous size and human-like shape. In one of the pictures that I took of this track, I placed my foot next to it on the ground. Keep in mind I'm wearing a size 13 boot. Whatever made this track was so heavy, heavier than the biggest bear, that it had pushed the gravel so far into the earth that it made us truly speculate what we were looking at. Other pictures that we took of the bear tracks were nowhere close to that indentation that this track had left. One of the most intriguing things about this track was that there were no visible claw marks. With all the other bear tracks, both of us felt extremely uneasy of our surroundings and had the feeling that we were being watched. For the rest of the day, we didn't have much to talk about and that night felt uncomfortable at camp. We never heard or smelled anything out of the ordinary. To this day, I'm not really sure what we saw, and I'm not making any claims other than the words I've put forth. I've only heard of one other story from an old native man that lived by himself, a true hermit. 
He spoke of a tall creature that walked on two legs and watched him for thirty minutes from across the river, which his heaven overlooked approximately two hundred feet away. When first sighted, he was motionless, staring straight at him. Then this creature, which he named Hairy Man, turned and briskly walked away. Here's my dogman story. Let me know what you think. Well, let's see. I'll start by saying that I wasn't expecting anything unusual to happen. My partner, Steve, and I attended his friend's annual CB get together at Grant County Park in Critton, Kentucky. It's about 45 minutes away from our home. It was the 1st of October, and the weather was pleasant in the 70s. The park spans 54 acres, offering plenty of space to explore, including a playground area, a baseball diamond with lights, and a basketball court. Additionally, the picnic area features five shelter houses, a horse ring with a barn and stadium, and two multi-purpose buildings. I love nature, so the ample space appealed to me, especially when dealing with people. I brought a few joints with me to help with pain and keep me calm. The get-together lasted from noon until whenever, and many people showed up. I brought cupcakes with us, but to my chagrin, I later learned that Steve's friend was diabetic and sugar was a no-go. So not the best first impression, but oh well, screw it. After grabbing something to eat, I decided to take a walk around since Steve knew most of the people there. Our picnic spot was up front, so I decided to explore the other side while smoking and taking in the surroundings. During my walk, I took pictures here and there with my phone, as I enjoy photography. I couldn't help but notice that I was being drawn to the woods behind the baseball diamond, and goosebumps covered my arms instantly. I felt a strong urge to go to that spot, even though I didn't sense any malevolence. It was just incredibly eerie to me that the pull was so strong. I knew something was there. I took out my phone and stopped walking, standing close to a tree that had caught my eye. I took a few pictures there and then started heading back to where everyone was, even though I still felt the strong urge to go to the area that had drawn me. Later that night, when we were back at home, I looked at the pictures I had taken and applied some grayscale effects to them because they looked awesome that way. I noticed that in one of the grayscale pictures of the tree, there was a distinct figure resembling a spirit. You could see it quite clearly. I showed it to Steve, and he thought it was cool, but then asked about something by the bush. That's when I saw it, a pair of eyes staring at me from the area I had been drawn to. I got goosebumps immediately upon seeing it. I initially thought I had captured a hellhound in my photo. But when I finally showed my pictures to my friend Teresa, who was into UFOs, Bigfoot, and the paranormal, I knew she'd be interested. When I told her where I took the pictures, she informed me it wasn't a hellhound, but a dogman. As a believer with an open mind who has seen and experienced many things, I thought it was incredibly cool. Teresa, on the other hand, didn't share my enthusiasm and warned me that I was lucky it didn't follow me home. Nevertheless, I didn't feel threatened by it or anything of the sort. Ready is a term that has shown up in many stories about close encounters of the third kind. I am very much on my guard for when this word shows up because I have had an encounter in which the word was spoken to me by a reptilian. In August 1959, my parents and I were traveling to Colorado Springs on a vacation. This was before my 11th birthday on August 19. For some unknown reason, Dad decided that we would stop and visit Mount Capulin, an extinct volcano in the northeast corner of New Mexico. Mom stayed in the tourist center while Dad and I climbed up the side of the volcano and down into the crater. Then we returned to the center. I had a desperate need to go to the bathroom. As I was walking through the center, I felt myself stop in mid-step. I felt my mind lift out of my body and drop straight through the floor. How deep, I cannot imagine. My drop ended in an arched tunnel deep underground. The tunnel was lighted with orange lights. 
Standing in front of me was a smallish being or entity that I now know to identify as a reptilian. I would estimate its height at somewhere around four feet tall. It was wearing a gray color robe with long sleeves and a hood. The most I could see of its face was intense, oversized dark eyes. In its left hand, number of fingers, unclear, but definitely a thumb. It held something that we today would describe as an iPad or the light. In its right hand, it held some kind of stylus. It looked straight at me and with mind-to-mind -mind talk said testily, What are you doing here? We're not ready for you yet. Then my mind zoomed back up through the ground and back into my head where I stood in the tourist center. Immediately, I double-timed it to the ladies' room and got relief just in time. Since then, I have lived wondering when the we that this alien or entity represented would be ready for me. I have had other encounters with UFO-related entities like the MIB dressed in a black warrant officer uniform driving a yellow Mini Cooper on a military base near Keflavik, Iceland. He told me, go home, and pointed towards the southwest in North America. Maybe the aliens or entities have visited me, and I don't remember it. Thanks for letting me tell my story. I used to work about 30 miles away from where I live. One night I had been stuck in heavy traffic coming home. I take LASIK, so after a while I really had to go to the bathroom. I kept telling myself that I was almost home and tried to hold it until I got there. By the time I got to my exit, I knew I wasn't going to make it to my house. So I pulled up to an area where Fidelity Investments is located and found an area that was isolated. This area is heavily wooded with walking trails and a lot of game, but it is also in a very populated area. I pull up a little side, drive off one of the main roads. That little drive is about 100 feet long with only room for one car. It went up an elevation and had bushes on the right side facing the main road. On the left side, there was a guardrail and a view of the valley below. The area up there is huge and isolated, with several buildings that are all spaced out. The place is dark at night because there are intermittent street lights up there. At night it's pretty deserted too. A few cars go through that area though because it's a shortcut people use to go from Taylor Mill over to 3L Highway, where there are stores, restaurants, etc. When you're up there, you're above everything around this area. When I stopped, I got out of my car, waited a moment and looked around to make sure there were no other cars. It was winter, so the bushes between where I was and the road below me didn't have many leaves on them. Because of that, you could see right through them. I was up on this little rise, about 20 or 30 feet above the drive, which was four lanes wide. To the left of me was a street light and more woods that went down another hill to the main road. I went to the back of my car and did what I had to do. When I finished, I stood up, and all at once, every hair on my body stood up. I knew I wasn't alone. I scanned the area in front of me and must have heard something behind me because I turned around, and there were three deer standing there, all huddled up together between my car and the guardrail. They weren't looking at me. They were looking across the road. I looked back over there, and that was when I saw a figure standing between the bushes in front of it and the tree line behind it. It was huge. I stand five foot five. Some of those bushes were about six feet tall, but they only came up to about the collarbone area on this thing. Due to the street light to the right of it, about twenty feet away, I was able to get a pretty clean outline of this thing. It had a large dog-shaped head and pointed ears. I couldn't make out at its neck, but I could make out massive shoulders. That's when it growled. It was a deep vibration I could feel in my chest. My body just took over at that point. I have to explain this part of it to you. I worked security for years in California in the music business. As a woman, I have to really work out and train to defend myself. I kickboxed for eight years and worked out every day. I also trained dogs mainly Anatolian Shepherds and German Shepherds. Sometimes I have to establish who is the Alpha, and to do that, I get them down. 
hold them in place, grab them by their ear and growl until they submit. Then the training can start. So when this thing growled at me, it was just pure instinct. I dropped then to a crouching position and growled right back at it. When I did that, it stopped growling and started sniffing the air. Its snout went up and it turned its head slightly as it was sniffing. It then took a few steps forward. I was still crouched down on all fours and moved forward, still growling at the thing. When I did that, it stopped. I stood up and kept staring right at it. I never broke eye contact with it. Then it slowly stepped back into the tree line until I couldn't make it out as clearly as before and started to move to the right of me. The deer were still behind me. They were so close I could have reached out and touched them. I waved my arms and told them to get out of there. When I did that, they went back over the guardrail and took off down the hill. That's when I jumped in my car and got out of there as fast as I could. I felt this thing was trying to circle behind me, and I wasn't going to wait around for that. Do I think I scared it? No, but I do think I confused it for a couple of minutes, and that gave me time to move. I told my husband about what had happened up there, but I didn't tell him exactly what I saw. He would think I was nuts, and to be honest, I thought I was a little crazy myself, until I saw a picture of a dogman. I know there are other things in this world that can't be explained. I've seen them, but this was beyond any of those things. Since this has happened, I can't take that shortcut through that area anymore. My husband took me back over that way once to see the area, and I was begging him to get me out of there the whole time. I thought I was going to throw up. The wildlife up there has almost totally disappeared. I never see anything up on the hills anymore. The street I live on is only about one mile or so down the hill from this place, and lately we have seen coyotes on the streets. Like they have been chased out and pets here have started to go missing. We've also seen a large black figure moving through our backyards down here. The dogs throughout the neighborhood go crazy regularly now, too. People were calling the cops when we saw that large black figure jumping fences. I'm concerned that it has come down the hill after eating everything up there. Sash Lake, visiting from Wiltshire, reported that at 12.20 p.m. I was leaving Drumna Drochit on a coach admiring the view while the coach was driving past the lot. It started to rain and a light fog rolled in. My view vision was partly limited due to the trees alongside the lock, but something caught my eye for approximately five seconds and made me jump out of my skin. I saw a huge black mass hump in the middle of the lock, roughly the size of a double-decker bus. I would say it was around 75, 100 yards away from me. I was confused and in disbelief. I jumped to my feet to get a better look. Trees completely blocked my view for about five, eight seconds. There was a clearing in the trees, and when I looked back to where I saw the black mass on, there was nothing there. A few years ago, a good friend of ours was in a car severe accident in which the passenger was in critical condition whom I didn't know, and the driver, who was our friend, was also in critical, but worse condition. Within the first 12 hours, our friend, whom I will refer to as Mary from here on out, died at the hospital. I am unsure of the fate of the passengers, as I didn't know them, but I believe they did survive. Originally, the news of her death was brought up to me by another friend, and later confirmed it when I looked it up and saw it on a news web page stating her full first and last name, which I might add is not a common last name at all, but don't feel comfortable disclosing here. Circumstances of the accident and location of the accident. After a couple days of checking for an obituary to get funeral details, I eventually saw it around day two or three, but unfortunately it said the family wished to have a private funeral open only to relatives, 
Death wasn't a new thing to me, as I unfortunately already had a few friends pass by at this point in time, but it was pretty unsettling not being able to say my final goodbyes at a funeral, as is usually the norm. Fast forward about three, four months or so, I'm going about my daily routine and coming up to a four-way stop sign at nearly the same time as another car. The other car pulled up to the stop sign and at the road perpendicular to my right. I remember this so vividly, and we'll never forget it. Knowing a car was there, I probably glanced at my phone for a second to let them go ahead, and some loud screaming caught my ear over the sound of the radio. I blow it off for a second, but it continues in increased frequency. I look over real quick, look forward again, and then it crosses my mind. No way in hell, and I look back over again. And damn if it isn't Mary leaning out her window of that other car, waving her arms all around screaming my name, trying to get my attention. The weirdest chill and feeling came over my body, literally as if I'm seeing a ghost and questioning my sanity on whether I was seeing things. At this point, I yelled out the window to tell her to turn right and pull over on the first street, which was within eyesight. I get out of the car and literally am stuttering, and don't have the first clue of what to say, and she just decides at that point to lean in and give me a hug. She was solid, and I could feel her hugging me, so at that point I was assured that she wasn't a ghost low. I explained to her how I'd grieved over her death, and how I saw her obituary, and everything, and she thought I was half crazy. I wish I could explain the way it feels to see somebody you knew was dead for a few months and then be able to hug them and have a chat in the most unexpected way possible. But I don't even know if there is a word in the English language to describe it. Now, where it gets really interesting is after sharing all the details I knew of her passing and accident, everything matched up minus the death part but I vividly remember seeing the obituary and the news article with her name and all the details of the accident that I explained to her. She actually did get in a terrible accident and was just released from the hospital a couple weeks before I saw her after she spent a couple months in the hospital. The exact road and location I told her were the correct spots too. The first 30 days she was in the hospital. She was in a coma and had a rough recovery and many surgeries following that, so it wasn't minor by any means. Later that day, I tried finding the obituary and news article, but they were nowhere to be found. But where did I get all the info from? This has been weird for a while, but for the longest time I blew it off as someone with the same name in a similar location, but I can't find anything on that either. The likelihood of someone with her exact unusual name is highly unlikely, too. Not sure if this was a glitch or if I shifted timelines. Seasons never change high enough above the snow line. In this land of endless forests and shrouds of drifting mist, I've hunted here on my people's traditional land with my father and with the ghosts of my ancestors. Guided in knowing my path, I call myself a man, but to those whose forest this is, I animal, friend. It was a day when the dark green shadow of the mountain held a bridal veil of pure white clouds. Old Raven was calling to me asking for crumbs from my sandwich. That is the last moment of my life when I was at peace. Many seekers of Skookum come here. They think they will find evidence of Bigfoot while they camp, hide camera traps, and hike a few miles into the ancient forests. I know Skookum, and it takes a lifetime of understanding and growth, not just a four-day hiking holiday in some amateur knowledge. There is a dark side to Bigfoot searches. Not all of those who track him are without knowledge. There is Silent Owl, a fallen medicine healer whose family died a few years ago during the plague that swept through our homes. His ways have changed. He will not use his magic to heal. The skookum in his eyes has grown cruel and broken. So when the hunters came and asked me if I was Joseph Pale, I told them I would not help them find Bigfoot, for it was their intention to shoot the legendary beast and become famous. I told them, Bigfoot is not an animal. 
He is like a man peaceful and considerate unless you are trespassing and planning to hurt his family. I will not help you, and I'd suggest you turn around. I thought that would be the end of it. They could go into the woods with their rifles, and they would find nothing but the ranger waiting to check their hunting permits. I doubted such men could even find an elk, let alone Bigfoot. They had no skookum, judging by their oversized rifles. I will help you, but not for less than double what you offered Little Fox. If he has said no, it now costs double. The chilling and calloused voice of Silent Owl spoke from my shadow where he had walked over from the lodge to see what the hunters wanted from me. Well, all right, the hunter who looked like Matthew McConaughey said. The others whooped with excitement. We're going to go bag ourselves a creature that doesn't even exist. Silent Owl took their money and went with them. I was horrified. The thought of Silent Owl leading them to the sacred lands, set aside for the forest people since the beginning of creation, was appalling and grotesque. I sat for a long time, feeling great woe and horror, knowing of the violation that those men planned to commit. My skookum grew weak inside me, and in its place rose up fear. I was truly afraid to do nothing, afraid of what would happen, Afraid on behalf of the peaceful and unsuspecting Bigfoot families that Silent Owl had betrayed, I resolved to go and to try and help them, to protect them if necessary. I am not a hunter of men, and the thought of turning my compound bow on a person and silently assassinating him frightened me. I was not sure where such a thought came from, but I could imagine having Silent Owl in my sights and putting an end to their expedition in just one shot. They might shoot back, but I would be long gone. I trembled, afraid of the consequences of murder, but I also realized I must be willing to do anything, or there was no point in going after them. I went home and called my dogs from the woods, Spritzer and Chief. They came to me, wagging their tails and to sniffed my hands, and sensed I was about to go on a big hunt, Spritzer growled. He didn't like my fear, but he obeyed me and got into the back of my truck. Chief seemed nervous, following me around while I packed. When I had my backpack ready, I took up my compound bow, a thirty-six caliber revolver, my hunting knife, and a survival hatchet. I loaded my truck with extra fuel and water and food for my dogs. For a long moment, I sat in the cab, in the muddy driveway of my trailer. It was a decision I had to choose to make. I could stop and do nothing, or I could take the warpath. We were soon off the highway and driving up an old dirt logging road, partially overgrown. I stopped at the creek and got out. We hiked the rest of the way up to where the road ends, and there we found the pickup that belonged to Matthew McConaughey and his buddies, and it was empty. They had already set out on foot up into the mountains. They had about six miles to hike before they were even at the edge of Bigfoot's territory. I followed them with fear of what they planned to do and fear of what I planned to do weighing in my mind. Old Raven found me and asked me, well, Where are you going? I ignored the creature and led my dogs. It grows dark in the forest before it is night, and I saw the campfire of Matthew McConaughey's hunting party, and I stopped and set up a cold camp. I fed my dogs and slept little, listening to the darkness and hearing the voices of the men as they bragged loudly. In the morning I waited until they left. I could have shot an arrow into the silent owl, but I was too afraid. We came to their camp, and I finished putting out their fire. The dripping pines weren't in danger of burning, but it annoyed me that they had littered and left their campfire smoking. My dog sniffed everywhere, sensing that we were hunting these men. They looked at me questioningly, and I said, I don't know either. I know this is strange, but I don't know how to turn back. When we reached the quiet mountain meadow where my grandfather had seen Bigfoot, I realized we were crossing the threshold. There was no turning back. We were entering into another world, an older and more civilized world. In this place... There was a balance between man and nature, and man wanted for nothing. They were hidden here, unseen by the cold and calculating eyes of science. I followed the tracks of the hunters easily, 
seeing how they blundered through the grass and bushes. The trees shed their dew like a soft rain, and birds who had never seen humans called to each other for the curious gossip of newcomers. I caught up to them and waited some distance away, crouching down and hidden. I thought to myself that if I was going to fire an arrow and put an end to this, that now would be the right time. All I could think about was them shooting back at me, chasing me, hunting me. I was frozen in fear, unable to take action. My dogs were growling softly as they too waited to strike. The hunting party moved on, and I followed them. We began to climb the side of the mountain, and I realized with anxiety that by now Bigfoot would know we were here. It occurred to me that I didn't need to do anything. If Bigfoot was disturbed by the intrusion, Bigfoot had great skookum, and he could fend for himself. I had told myself this and used it as an excuse to abandon my foolish pursuit of the hunters. Both of my opportunities to fire an arrow and end Silent Owl's betrayal had resulted in me paralyzed by fear. I knew I would do nothing. There was no point in me trying. So I told myself to let Bigfoot defend his own lands and to turn back. That is, when things became terrifying. My dog smelled something in the air they didn't like. Their loyalty to me shattered as I told them to stop and to stay, but they ran away, whimpering in terror. I turned, and soon I could smell Bigfoot, like rancid swamp water. The foul wind turned my stomach and drove a primal fear into me like a thorn. I looked up, my eyes watering, and saw a blurry image of one great hand curled around a tree at a monstrous height. The angry eyes, almost human, peered out at me from behind the wood. I shook and stood frozen, looking back at it. There was a low growl from the creature, and then it called out in a voice that was too much like the howl of a man. I fell to my knees and dropped my weapon. I put up my hands, covering my head. I looked down from it, my instincts commanding my movements. I wanted to survive, and I could sense its rage and its hostility. I prayed, my lips murmuring. Great Spirit, please show me his animal, friend. I meant no harm coming here. Forgive me. Teach this son of the forest I am not its enemy. Put compassion in its heart. Bigfoot looked at me and heard my frightened whimpering. It stared down on me for a long time, breathing heavily. It belted an enraged roar, but it did not lift me or harm me. I shook with terror, fearing for my life. Then the ground shook as it stomped away and left me there. My legs were shaking as I tried to stand, but my fear had overwhelmed me. I fell down, alone without my dogs, and lay staring up into the lit green canopy. I took a long time, but my skookum gradually built up inside me, and I decided to follow Bigfoot. I knew that if it thought I was an enemy, I would already be dead. On the ridge I saw the hunters. They had found Bigfoot tracks and were following them. The one who looked and sounded exactly like Matthew McConaughey was in the lead. Silent Owl was behind them. He was looking around, sensing that some hidden danger had him in their sights. This time I let my arrow fly. Silent Owl fell from the ridge, and the other hunters did not notice until he had plummeted to his death. I felt sorrow for my actions, but I knew it was just. He had led the hunters to Bigfoot, and in doing so, he had begun the killing that was to follow. Forgive me, brother. May you find peace with your loved ones on the other side. I spoke on behalf of Silent Owl, hoping that he would find forgiveness in death and be reunited with his family. For the hunters, death was not so kind or gentle. They found Bigfoot, or rather a band of four younger male Bigfoot found them. They were in a savage mood, having watched all the females and children of their tribe flee in terror. The older male Bigfoot had gone, too. I called out a warning, hoping they would run for their lives. I'd watched the Bigfoot flee before the hunters could find them, vanishing into the forest from the open mountain meadows below. The hunters looked to my position on the ridge, having heard my warning cry. One of them used his rifle scope to identify me. For a split second, I thought I'd be shot, but they knew nothing of my fault in Silent Owl's death. They never climbed down to his body to see the broken arrow. 
Then the Bigfoot attacked. Their first assault was a test of the strength of the intruders. They didn't kill any of them, but they left injuries and terror on the faces of the hunters. They fired their rifles at close range, but managed to miss with every shot. When the Bigfoot retreated, the hunters were too terrified to continue, all except Matthew McConaughey. I followed him as he set out alone, deep into Bigfoot territory. He was determined to slay Bigfoot and would not back down from their guerrilla antics. We came to a part of the forest that was very old, and great boulders were all that remained of some primeval mountain. Beneath the boulders were shallow caves. Each cave had the skeletal remains of a Bigfoot. We had entered their burial ground. Every Bigfoot that had ever died was brought to this place for countless generations. Going back to the very first day, I shuddered in dread of what the spirits would think of me for entering such a sacred place without right, without tribute. I took one last candid look at Matthew McAnaughey, where he was crouched and handling the skull of Bigfoot. I left him there and went back the way I had come. As I wandered back through the forest, I found the first of the fleeing hunters. Bigfoot had broken his neck. I gasped in horror at the sight, but I left his remains there. I had my own skin to save, and I wasn't out of the woods yet. I found the second hunter dead as well. The Bigfoot had relentlessly pursued them and killed at least two of them. I felt dread as I realized the Bigfoot were close, and they were killing every man in sight. Would I be hunted down and brutally slaughtered? I heard gunshots in the distance. I knew the Bigfoot had found the last hunter. I moved on slowly and cautiously. Night was falling, and I felt trepidation at the thought of camping or wandering in the dark. I pressed on, almost to the creek. There I found the last of the hunters. They had torn him to pieces and scattered him all over the place. His rifle was twisted and smashed. I felt sick as the last light was fading. I knelt at the small waterfall and threw up. When I arose, my panic grew to screaming heights as I saw I was surrounded by angry Bigfoot. I knew it was about to be all over. They would descend on me and tear off my arms and bite through my neck. I cowed at the sight of them and again fell to my knees. They were closing in on me when I heard a loud and almost chuckling grunting noise. I looked up and saw the massive old Bigfoot I'd first seen. He had come and seen me and was telling the others to let me go. The Bigfoot looked at their leader and then they backed away from me and left me there, shaking in terror. I fled through the forest, following the creek until I came to the old logging road. I took one look at Matthew McConaughey's abandoned vehicle, and I knew it would stay there and rust. Nobody was coming back from the hunting party. I walked toward my own vehicle, and when I got there, I tossed my backpack into the back. Chief looked up at me and whined. He had hidden there, waiting for my return. I called a spritzer, but he never came. With my heart heavy at his disappearance, I drove us back to the highway and took us home. That night I sat with my hands shaking and my nerves frayed. I had survived that my memories of what I had seen and how terrible it all was would linger in my mind forever. I would never have peace again. As I sat thinking about it, I wondered what had become of my other dog. Chief had come inside, having had enough of the woods. He sat miserable, missing his brother. As we sat staring at his empty place by the fire, I heard barking outside. I opened the door, and there he was. Spritzer had traveled all night and somehow found his way home. I was overjoyed, and some part of me began to feel hope. I realized the Bigfoot would again know the peace and isolation they needed to survive. They had let me go because they are not monsters, and they forgave me. Spritzer's return home was like a sign that in the end, all would be well. Hello, I'm a bus driver in a small town in England, and I think I've just picked up a passenger's soul on my bus. This happened two nights ago. I've worked with this bus company for eight half years, and I've driven the same route for three years. Over this time, I have gotten regulars that I've come to know as I see them multiple times a day, some young and some old. 
I take them to work or to the shops and bingo. I often jump out to help my older passengers with their shopping and whatnot. I've had a passenger that I've taken for the full three years I've done this route. Let's call her Jane. Jane is an elderly lady who suffers from dementia. She was well-functioning for the last two and a half years, sometimes a little confused, but I was always patient and helped her however she needed. I used to pick her up from the bus stop right outside her house, literally a ten-second walk from her door to the bus stop. Every day, I'd take her from her house to the local shopping center where she played bingo with friends. However, her dementia worsened in the last six months after an incident on my bus where she got very confused and distressed. I had to stop my bus and try to settle her down. Someone on the bus knew her son, who thankfully worked close by and came over to help. I told my manager, who understood and approved for my passengers to get off my bus and catch the next one just behind, so I could stay with Jane. Her son came, calmed her down, took her home and thank me for the help. We spoke about Jane, and I explained how we had become friendly over the last few years I'd been on the route. I explained she hadn't freaked out like this before. He said he knew, and she spoke fondly of me. Her dementia had worsened, causing her to have bad spells. He took my number and said he would get in touch to arrange a gift for looking after Jane. I insisted it was okay, and that I didn't want a gift, but he insisted. He took my number and his mother and left the bus. I never saw Jane again after that day, but I did see the son at the shops. He explained that Jane had gotten worse and unfortunately wasn't safe to leave the house. I thanked him for letting me know, wished her the best, and asked to be kept up to date with her condition as we had become friends over the years. This leads to last night. I had been covering the late night shift all week when around 11.30 p.m., I was driving by Jane's house. The bus was completely empty. But as I approached the stop, I thought of Jane as I normally do. For some reason, I had an urge to stop at the bus stop outside her house. Even though I could see there wasn't anyone waiting, the urge was so strong that I did. I opened the doors and waited for a second. A cold rush of air entered the bus, and I closed the doors and drove on. I could feel a presence on the bus. About five minutes later, or six stops down the road, I felt someone next to my cab on the bus, as if someone was waiting to get off. I stopped again and opened the doors. I felt the presence leave, and I again continued on, feeling a bit confused. I fully believe in the paranormal. So when I got a call this morning from Jane's son to tell me she passed away two nights ago in her home around 11 p.m., I broke down... I had forgotten about the strange feeling I had that night with a presence on my bus until the funeral. I took the day off and attended the funeral for Jane before going back to the son's house for the wake. The son's house was 30 seconds from the stop where I had let the presence off. I don't know if this is crazy or if I'm just being stupid, but I picked up a presence from right outside Jane's house 30 minutes after she passed and dropped it off at her son's house. Could I have taken Jane's soul on a final trip to see her son before she passed on to whatever is beyond? I really want to believe I did so. I have comfort in the idea that I drove her one last time to see her son one last time. Does anyone else have an experience like this? Thank you, and sorry for the long read. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.